Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to your Lecture 6 skill check. Here we're going to go through an example where we're conducting a chi-squared goodness of fit test. And so the basic idea is we have a single categorical variable with several categories. We have a population distribution across those categories. And then we have a sample, which we want to test to see whether that sample is consistent with the population distribution. So in the current example, in this scenario, we're looking at chess games. And what we're looking at is the different defenses that the player with the black pieces can play when white starts the game with the king pawn two squares forward. And so there's a number of defenses that can be played. There's the king's pawn opening, Sicilian, Scandinavian, French, Caracan, and then a whole bunch of other minor defenses, which I just put into one category. So the idea is, uh, we, is, is uh, we're imagining that we looked at an online chess site. Actually, come to think of it, I literally did look at an online chess site. And I checked out the proportion of times each of these defenses was played out of millions of games. So at least 10 million games. So a huge number. These are the proportions that I found, and we can take these proportions as a population distribution. So these proportions represent essentially the probability that each of these defenses is played in a randomly selected chess game taken from that online chess club. So in this third column, what we're imagining is we went to a local chess club, and we randomly selected 125 games, and we just counted the number of games uh, in which each of these defenses was played. So this data is actually made up. Unlike the, the, the second column, those proportions actually came from a website. The local chess club data I just made up. So here's the whole point of the test. We have a sample that could have been drawn from this population distribution. And we want to determine whether or not that is the case. And the essential idea is here we have counts. But if we were to turn these counts into proportions, we would see that these proportions are different than the population proportions. However, if they're only a little different, that can be due to sampling variability. If they're a lot different, that could indicate that the distribution uh, across these defenses in the local chess club is different than it is in the online chess club. So this is the sort of the, the big picture. So the important thing to remember is in a, in a chi-squared goodness of fit test, we're always comparing a population distribution uh, against a sample distribution. Um, now it's helpful to sort of just summarize the chi-squared goodness of fit test, in part because in the end we're going to see three different kinds of chi-squared tests, and each one is a little bit different. So we want to make sure we keep in our head the distinctions between them. So in a goodness of fit test, you're given a sample of counts across one categorical variable in a frequency table, right? So this is our frequency table here. We have one categorical variable, defense. We have six categories, and here we have a frequency table. These are the frequencies that were observed in our sample. And so what do we do with that is, is we're going to ask whether those counts are consistent with a specified distribution. In this case, the specified distribution are these proportions. Now, the counts are drawn from one population. It's important to remember that, sorry, these counts here are drawn from a single population. In this case, it's the population of games played at a local chess club. The null hypothesis is that the sample is consistent with the specified distribution, as we will see. So, uh, in summary, when you have a goodness of fit test, there's one categorical variable, in this case, it's the defense plate, and the sample is drawn from one population. So let's work through these questions. So first, if we want to conduct the chi-squared goodness of fit test, we need to make sure that certain conditions hold. And so let's just go through what those conditions are. The first condition is that the data must be counts for categories. And Excuse me. In this case, we do have counts for categories. We have six categories, which are the different defenses played. And for each category, we have some count. So clearly, this condition is satisfied. 
Second, the data must come from a random sample. Well, you know, no matter what test we're conducting, the data must always come from a random sample. And this is meant to maximize the probability of independence. And specifically in this case, the point is to ensure that the only systematic difference between the games that are played here is just the defense that was chosen. And finally, the expected count for each category must be at least five. This is something we can't check right away because we don't have expected counts. We only have observed counts. So we will have to compute the expected counts before we can test this condition. What are the hypotheses for the chi-squared goodness of fit test? Well, quite simply, again, we are testing whether the observed counts are consistent with the proposed population distribution. The null hypothesis is that they are consistent. The alternative is that they are not. Next, we're going to calculate the expected counts for each category, uh, and we're going to put those into a table. Right, so this is the really the only computationally intense part is when we start working with tables. Typically, on a test, let's say a midterm, you won't have to do these kinds of calculations, but it is very helpful to work through them and to think about what you're doing as you work through them to help you understand how these tests work. So here, uh, in the end, we're going to need to calculate the, the uh, expected counts for each of these categories. And the basic idea is this. Remember that when you conduct a hypothesis test, you always start with the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. If the null is true, then we expect 40% of games in any random sample to be King's Pawns opening. So that's 40% on average. So in a sample of 125, we expect on average to see 40% of those games to be King's Pawn opening. And now what's 40% of 125? Well, it's 50 games. So we can expect, if the null is true, the expected number of games in this first category is 50, which is somewhat different than what was observed. We need to do the same calculation for all six categories so we can compare uh, observed values with the expectations under the null hypothesis. And so these are actually calculated here. Now I want to make sure you know where these numbers come from. So uh, once again, if we look at the second category, if the null is true, 19% of games will be Sicilian, so 0 0.19, which means if we take a sample of size 125, then we expect on average that 23.75 of those games will uh, be a Sicilian opening, a Sicilian defense. Likewise, for, for Scandinavian defense, we expect under the null hypothesis that 10% of games will be Scandinavian, which means on average, we expect that 125 times 10%, 12.5 games on average will be Scandinavian. Uh, to say, just to say more clearly, what, what I mean is if we take samples, random samples of size 125, we expect on average that about 12 and a half games on average will be Scandinavian defense, right? So you can see we can do the same calculation for all of these defenses, for all of these categories. And so now, in the end, we get observed values which we can compare with their expectations. Again, these are expectations assuming the null hypothesis is true. So one thing we need to notice um, is that all of these expectations are at least five. So that was the third condition that needs to be satisfied in order to conduct this goodness of fit test. Right, I just want to point out that it's true that if we look at the observations in this category, the fifth category, we have only four observations, which is less than five. That doesn't matter. What matters, all that matters, is that the expectations under the null hypothesis are at least five, and you can see that they are. So that condition is satisfied. Um, now, we're going to go ahead and calculate for each observed value. We're going to compare the observed with the expected 
and here we calculate the contribution that observation uh, makes toward the chi-squared statistics. So remember what we're doing. We're going to calculate this squared deviance that's been scaled by expectation. So we're going to calculate this statistical distance is really what it is. We're going to calculate the statistical distance between each observation and its expectation. We're going to add those up to get our chi-squared statistic. Uh, so where did the 4.5 come from? Let me just uh, show you that. So if we were to take the observation, in this case is 35, minus what was expected under the null hypothesis is 50. So this is the difference. We square the difference, and then we divide by that expectation again. So that's 50. We get 4.5. So this is the contribution to the chi-squared statistic made by this first observation. Let's just do the second one. So if we go 46 was observed, the expected value was only 23.75, so quite a bit smaller. We take that difference, we square it, and then we divide by the expectation, 23.75. And we get 20.8447, so it's, it's a fairly big value. So we can repeat this calculation for all the observed values. And then we're going to add up all those numbers. So what does that look like? Oh, so we did this already. OK. Uh, what does that look like? Well, we're going to get to that in a minute. So that, that adding, calculating those values and adding them up, that's the uh, part of question five where we're going to calculate the chi-squared statistic. Before we go there, it's the next step that we need to do is to set up the test, which means we want to specify our decision rule for the test. So one thing to remember is that the degrees of freedom for a goodness of fit test is always one less than the number of categories. So here we have six categories. The degrees of freedom is five. Why does that matter? Well, it tells us where to look in the chi-squared table. We're going to look at five degrees of freedom. The test that we're conducting was specified to be a 1% test, and so the critical value for this test is 15.086. So what does that mean? That means for our decision rule, we're going to reject the null hypothesis at the 1% level of significance if our test statistic is bigger than this critical value, 15.086. And again, I just want to just emphasize, when will that be the case? If, if we compare the observations, which are in this third column, with the expectations under the null, if those, if those differences tend to be large, then the null probably isn't true. We're going to wind up with a test statistic, a chi-squared statistic, that is much bigger than this critical value. But if the expectations and observations are similar enough, then the chi-squared statistic will be small and will be less than this critical value. So you can see the chi-squared statistic in the end is a measure of statistical difference. The bigger that difference between what was observed and what you would expect to have seen under the null hypothesis, the bigger that difference, the more likely it is that the null hypothesis is not true. So now we're going to see what that difference is by calculating the chi-squared statistic. And so we, we've got this far. Uh, let me just do one more just to be sure that we all understand where these numbers are coming from. So again, the idea is we just compare what was observed, in this case 5, minus what will be expected if the null was true, in this case 12.5. So there's our difference. We're going to square that difference and then divide by that expectation again, so 12.5. And so this gives us the contribution to the chi-squared statistic um, um, by that third uh, observed value. So here we'll put in a 4.5, and we can go down through each pair of observed and expected and calculate uh, each contribution to the chi-squared statistic. So in the end, assuming you did this yourself already, you're going to get these values. And the thing to notice here, the interesting thing to notice, is that um, if you look at all six observations, most of them make a fairly small contribution to the chi-squared statistic. The only really substantial 
contribution is made by this second this uh, second category. So this category was the Sicilian defense, as we shall see. And what we're looking at here, what we're seeing is that the observed count is much bigger than what would be expected under the null hypothesis. So which is to say that in the local chess club, this defense is being played much more often than you would expect if the, the, uh, the proportions that we derived from the online chess um, were consistent with that club level chess. Um, I don't think I said that in a very good way. Um, let me just try once more. Um, the idea is if the null is true, and if club chess players are choosing each of these defenses roughly the same proportion as online players, then we would expect this many of the uh, games in that sample on average to, uh, to have been the second category. That was the Sicilian defense. But in observation, we get a number much bigger. So which is saying that at that local chess club, they're playing this defense much more than that def the same defense is being played online. Okay, I'm going to come back to this. I, I'm still not convinced I explained that very well. So uh, I'll say something about that again at the end. The important thing, if I go back, the important thing is in the end, we get a test statistic that is very large. And so that's going to tell us that we're probably going to reject the null hypothesis. Well, let's draw a conclusion. So here, we, we certainly we can reject the null hypothesis at the 1% level of significance because this test statistic is huge compared to the critical value. It's, it's, it's more than twice the critical value. And in fact, if we, if we think of this in terms of p-values, um, at the critical value, the area in the tail is 1%. At this value, at the test statistic value, which is way to the right, the area in that upper tail is going to be very, very small indeed. It's going to be essentially zero. Um, right. And so again, the major contributor to this test statistic was this second category, the Sicilian defense. And that's because it was that second category um, that produced the largest contribution to the chi-squared statistic. Okay, back to the fronts. Right, so let's look at the p-value. So we're still talking about the five degrees of freedom, right? And the thing to notice is that if our test statistic was 16.750, so if we put 16.750 here, the area in the upper tail is 0 0.005. That's one half of 1%. This statistic is the test statistic that we actually got. It's more than twice that. And so we can expect the p-value to be essentially zero. And so what that tells us is that we have very small, uh, sorry, we have very strong evidence against the null hypothesis in this case. Now, how do we get an exact p-value? We go to Minitab. So I'll just show you how, let me just show you how to use Minitab. Uh, for this kind of problem. So here you can see in the table, I have one column where I write down the different defenses. I have another column where I show the population proportions, and the third column are the sample values. And so to do the test, we go to stat, tables, goodness of fit test, one variable, and we get this window. And so in this window, we're going to specify where the observed counts are located. So if we go, let me just take these out so I can show you how they're filled. So if we go uh, here, the observed counts are in the column that's labeled sample. That's this column right here. So that's that. The, the category names are in this first column. And so I can specify those as, as uh, like that. And lastly, we need to specify the proportion. So I'm going to pick specific proportions. These specific proportions are in the second column uh, that's labeled population. So these proportions here. So we're going to put those in. And now that we have this set up, we just press OK, and everything we need comes up. So let's just get this out of the way if I can. Uh, and there we are. Yep. So here's our table. It shows the categories the observations, the, the uh, proportions that we're comparing those observations to, the expectations are listed, and then the contribution of each observation to this chi-squared statistic. Uh, 
that's all given. And down below that, we can see we have some summary statistics, the, uh, the sample size, degrees of freedom, the chi-squared statistic, and the p-value, which you can see is essentially zero. So all of that is uh, as it is here. And so what does that p-value tell us? Uh, let's see, I think I was gonna say, oh, there, okay. The p-value tells us that we have very strong or possibly overwhelming evidence against the null hypothesis. Uh, we don't really know exactly how small the p-value is, but we can predict that it's going to be, well, we know it's at least zero to three decimal places, and it's probably much smaller than even that. So very, very strong or overwhelming evidence against the null hypothesis. Now, just I want to emphasize again, what does that mean? So here we have our six defenses, our observations, and over here in this column, we have the expectations. And again, the thing to, to, uh, to notice is that of all of these defenses, the one that contributed most to the chi-squared statistic, like by far, is this Sicilian defense, where you can see that the number of times that Sicilian defense was played uh, amongst those 125 games randomly chosen from, uh, from the local chess club, uh, that number of observations is much larger than what would be expected if the null was true. And that is the reason why we have such a large contribution to the chi-squared statistic for that category. Sorry, for that, uh, yeah, for that category. Um, right, so why are, we why are we rejecting the null hypothesis? It's largely because um, people in the local chess club are playing the Sicilian much more frequently than people who play online. That's something that we can conclude from this data. So I think that's interesting. I hope that makes sense to you. So don't forget, you can put questions into the comments if you have any, or you could save them for class when I see you and ask them then. Uh, apart from that, I guess we're pretty much done. So thank you for your attention. I hope this was helpful. Uh, stay tuned for more of these skill checks. Bye-bye.